Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa afdhalu salati wa atimu taslima ala sayyidina Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I was scheduled to actually speak after my friend Iman Badawi. She was speaking on Khadija radiallahu anha. And I was thinking while I was preparing this talk how difficult it is for anyone to speak after we have all heard about Khadija radiallahu anha. So qaddar Allah ma sha'a fal. Um, and I get to speak first, so alhamdulillah. And my topic is no other than um, the most prominent wife of the Prophet wasallam after Khadija, and she is Aisha radiallahu anha. And it was actually, if we look at the Prophet wasallam, it was his nature to make people around him feel that they were the most beloved person to him. So whoever came into contact with the Prophet وسلم, the impression they got from him was that I am the most beloved to the Messenger So this emboldened people, gave them so much confidence that actually one of the uh, uh, Sahaba uh, by the name of Amr bin al-Az, he actually felt um, emboldened enough to ask the Prophet وسلم, who is the most beloved of all people to you? And he felt that the Prophet was actually going to say you. He actually was expecting this answer. So when he asked that question, the answer he got from the Prophet was actually Aisha. Which means that he's, the Prophet answered that Aisha is the most beloved to me of all the people. And he said, I meant among the men. And he answered, now again he was hoping that he would be the one who would be the most, who was the most beloved to him. And the Prophet answered, Abiha, which means her father. Now, the Prophet was referring to Abu Bakr, but he didn't say Abu Bakr. He actually referenced uh, Abu Bakr through Aisha, again, highlighting the extent of love that he had for her. Now, we notice that when you look at the hadith that Aisha has transmitted to us in the Sunnah, thousands of hadith, you see the Sahaba referred to her in a very, very honorable title that actually no one else has. They say, like when we, in English we translate it on the authority of such and such narrator. In Arabic it actually is for Aisha radiallahu anha it is حدثني الصديقة بنت الصديق حبيبة حبيب الله المبرعة في كتاب الله Which means that I narr narrate to you on the authority of الصديقة, the truthful. بنت الصديق the daughter of the truthful, referring to Abu Bakr. Habibu to Habibillah, the beloved of the beloved of Allah. Al Mubarra'a fi kitabillah, the one who was exonerated, yani her innocence was made clear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book. When Aisha radiallahu anha was cleared of the false accusations that were made against her. No one else has this description, the entire sunnah of the Prophet. And you know, to give an idea of the kind of impact she's had globally, just look at the number of women that carry her name today. In all parts of the globe, you know, from Africa to Europe, every continent, and not just now, but throughout all these centuries of Islam, countless women have uh, carried her name to the point that it probably is the most popular single Muslim woman name. And actually she, when we talk about her, it's very difficult to go through every aspect of her personality and contributions, but one of the things we find about her is she was one of the few wives of the Prophet ﷺ who had actually committed the whole Qur'an to memory. She had actually memorized the whole Qur'an. And others included Hafsa and Umm uh, Salama. And she was the one in whose presence the Prophet ﷺ received the most revelation. No one else in the presence of no other wife did the Prophet ﷺ receive as much revelation as he did in the presence of Aisha anha. To the point that even when they were together in bed, you would have Jibreel السلام, descend to them in that state. So subhanAllah, no one else has the honor that Aisha anha has, again showing uh, Allah's pleasure with her. And in fact, Jibreel السلام, he himself used to uh, extend his salams to her. And the Prophet would say to her, Ya Aisha, Hada Jibreel, Yukrawa alayhi salam. That, Oh Aisha, this is Jibreel, and he's saying salam to you. And she would answer, Wa alaykum as salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And once it so happened that after one of the battles, the Battle of Ahzab, Aisha saw someone wearing a yellow imam, a yellow turban. 
And she noticed that man and the Prophet then later told her that in fact that was, it was Jibreel. So she was actually the only wife of the Prophet وسلم, who would actually see Jibreel in his human form. She narrated a total of 2,210 ahadith. This is a massive uh, portion of our deen we get from Aisha radiallahu anha. If you look at uh, Bukhari, it's about 6,000 uh, narrations. So this is an incredible, um, a significant contribution of uh, Aisha radiallahu anha. Actually, she's number four in the top narrators of hadith. You have Abu Huraira, Ibn Amr, Anas bin Malik, and the number four is Aisha radiallahu anha. And Bukhari and Muslim both carry her narrations as well as uh, the other Sahih books of Ahadith. If we look at the Quran and Sunnah and study through it the various righteous people throughout history that have been accused of adultery, we find the names of Maryam salam. She was accused of adultery. Who was it that um, made it clear to all the people that in fact she was innocent? It was Aisa salam, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the power to speak as a child and she was thus exonerated, yani free of the accusation. And then we also see the example of Yusuf. He was also a righteous person who was accused of adultery in his uh, in his youth, in his uh, years of early manhood. And who was it that exonerated him? It was actually Imrat Aziz, the wife of Aziz, who at the, finally at the end uh, confessed that he was uh, innocent of the charge that was being brought forth. But who was it that exonerated Aisha عنها, when she was in fact accused of adultery also? It was none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who in the Qur'an revealed verses about her, exonerating her and freeing her and actually taking the believers to task who had actually participated in this rumor and uh, scandal against her. No one else has this distinction of being uh, freed of these types of accusations by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Now if we talk a little bit about um, Aisha, it really starts with her parents. This is the foundation of her, of her goodness, the tarbiyah that she received. She was actually the daughter of, as we know, Abu Bakr and her mother is Umm Ruman. The Prophet had living nicknames for Aisha. He used to call her Humaira because she had a reddish, a reddish tinge to her skin. And Hamra in Arabic is, uh, refers to red, redness. So Humaira is the diminutive female form of that. And he also another nickname for her, showing the um, you know, affection that he had, and he used to call her Aish. And again, going back to her parents, because you know it's really hard to understand, um, you know, all of the virtue uh, and the tarbiyah that she received if we don't know uh, about her parents. We start with her mother, Umm Ruman bin Amil. The Prophet ﷺ said about the mother of Aisha, Umm Ruman. Man sarrahu an yandhuru ila imra'a min al-hur al-ain, fal yandhur ila Umm Ruman. That whoever is pleased to see one of the women of paradise, let uh, him look to Umm Ruman. Let him look to the mother of Aisha, Umm Ruman. And actually, when um, after this whole scandal of if the uh, Umm Ruman, the mother of Aisha, Allah passed away, the Prophet actually went to her grave and said, "Allahumma lam yafi alayka ma laqiyat Umm Ruman fika wa fi rasulik." He went to the grave of Umm Ruman and said, "Oh Allah." It is not hidden from you what Umm Ruman has achieved yani in status with you and with the Prophet, with his messenger, with the Prophet yani She had achieved such a high station, such a high ranking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet through her Islam, through her actions and her Iman. And her father, of course, needs no introduction. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, whose kunya is Abu Quhafa and his name is Abdullah bin Uthman. You know the Prophet said about him, that if I were to take a close, intimate, associate, a deep, beloved friend from the Ummah, it would have been Abu Bakr. And he was the only choice for the Prophet. So no one came closer to that level of relationship that they had. And uh, when we see Aisha, she is growing up in this household. She is only six years old when she's engaged to the Prophet وسلم, and she's married to him at the age of nine. Now, we know what, what a tremendous impact the company that one keeps has on one's personality and, and spirituality. So we want to look into the household of Aisha عنها, What kind of influences were present in her house that were shaping this young child and this, her young mind? 
poor defense that were coming to the house of the Prophet Unlike many of the Sahaba, Aisha is one of the few Sahaba who, who grew up in Islam, whose both parents were Muslim from the very beginning. Many of them became Muslim in their 40s or 50s. Many of them had to invite their parents to Islam. Many of them were not accepted by their parents when they became Muslim. You have so many uh, painful stories of the Sahaba that were rejected even by their own parents. Aisha radiallahu anha is one of those special cases where she sees her parents from a young age in Islam, memorizing Quran, and being frequented by the most righteous people that walked the face of the earth at that time. Who was the visitor who used to come morning and evening to the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha regularly as Aisha radiallahu anha was growing up? It was none other than the Prophet He was a regular visitor, a regular a frequenter of the house of Abu Bakr So this is the house, this is the environment, this is the tarbiyah she's receiving from the very, very beginning. So we see she grows up in the house of Siddiq and her tarbiyah culminates in the house of Rasul So what kind of, you know, of an impact is this going to have and what kind of an individual is going to be produced when they have these two unbelievable monumental influences um, on her life? And this really was the hikmah, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was preparing her for the role that she was going to diligently uh, fulfill with, um, with such uh, beauty as she did. I want to talk a little bit about the age of Aisha radiallahu anha when she got married because I know all of you are bombarded as um, young Muslims uh, with all the Islamophobia and all the other different types of taunts and attacks that the Prophet is subjected to. This is one of the things that always comes up is the age of Aisha radiallahu anha when she got married to the Prophet right? She was nine years old. Now, first of all, if, if some of you are still shocked or by that or, or find it unsettling, the first thing we have to do is leave our cultural prejudices at the door. If we really want to understand the situation, we kind of have to you know, go back uh, to the time and understand the cultural uh, context of the age. And this is one of the basic premises of any objective anthropological study, is that you can superimpose the standards of your own culture on another custom, on another culture, on another tradition. You kind of have to uh, you know, look, at, look at them in a fair and honest way. It is completely acceptable social practice in Hartford, Connecticut today in 2011 may not be socially tolerable at all in a small village in Uganda, even, even today. So, as, as Dr. Jonathan Brown, he's actually uh, a specialist in hadith, he teaches in um, Georgetown University. He's extensively traveled the Muslim world, and one of the things we learn from him is that he speaks uh, strongly about the uh, validity of cultural relativism, which means that the more you travel, and you know, the more you're exposed to the different cultures and traditions of, of different people, the more you can appreciate the broad spectrum of what is considered normal, and acceptable social behavior and how that changes and varies tremendously from time to time and, and place to place to place. So keeping that in mind, in um, you know Arabia at the time, as soon as a girl attained the age of puberty, she was considered marriageable. She it was perfectly fine for her to get married. This was the norm for them. And interesting to note, even here um, in the States, in many parts of you know, the world that we are exposed to, the standards we are used to, until 1886, the age of consent was six years old. In, same, the, uh, same as the age of Aisha al-Bilan when she got engaged. And even in Massachusetts, till this day, the age of consent is 12. So subhanAllah, yani, you will see this uh, you know, broad spectrum and cultural uh, rel relativism which we refer to. And how is it that the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took place? Was he pursuing uh, her? Was he seeking uh, her hand in marriage? In fact, Aisha radiallahu anha was suggested to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by another Sahabi by the name of Khawla. Khawla was the one who said to the Prophet, you know, why don't you marry Sauda, an older uh, woman, or you can marry Aisha. And the Prophet actually said no. He said, I was, I'm, I'm not going to marry uh, Aisha at this time. Uh, and rather what he did is he married Sodan. But Abu Bakr an, is the one who actually pursued this matter further. He went to the Prophet وسلم, and asked and proposed um, on for Aisha. An. And in fact, even then, the Prophet وسلم, was not ready uh, at that point. And it wasn't later until Aisha was a little bit older that the Prophet وسلم, in fact accepted. And this was because of a dream. He had. He had a dream three times where Jibreel 
السلام, actually came to him and he had someone wrapped in, in a garment of green silk and then had the face of this person was unveiled before the Prophet وسلم, and he saw that it was Aisha anha, and the Jibreel was telling him that this is your wife and he had this dream three times so he was under religious mandate to marry Aisha anha, and this is how the nikah took place so who is really the one arranging the marriage? It's no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this great hikmah, this great wisdom that he had uh, in mind. Now, Aisha radiallahu anha, because she got married at such a young age, her mind was very impressionable. And someone with such a, a young, fresh mind is able to retain and absorb and preserve for much longer time than someone else who is older and not able to have that level of retention and memorization. So this is really the hikmah and the wisdom which allowed her to convey the prophetic legacy which she so accurately and intimately was able to do. So no, none of us, none of you should ever feel uh, you know, a squirm in your seat or feel uncomfortable or uh, unsettled about her age. It should be very clear in your mind uh, why and how it happened and the divine wisdom that we have 2,210 hadith to prove it with. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the knowledge of Aisha radiallahu anha. She was truly the greatest student among the wives of the Prophet sallallahu In fact, when the Sahaba, the senior Sahaba, were disagreeing among themselves about a matter, they would say, okay, let's go to the one who's going to clarify the matter for us. And they were referring to Aisha radiallahu anha. And they said that there was nothing that we would ask her about. Except that we would find some knowledge that she had about any matter that we would ask her about. And the Masruq, one of the great Dabi'i from the generation that came after the Prophet he said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْنَا أَنْكَادٍ مِنْ صَحَابَةِ الرَّسُولِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَسْأَلُونَ عَيْشَ عَنِ الْفَرَائِنِ That we saw the senior companions of the Prophet وسلم, asking Aisha radiallahu anha about the matters of the deen. And Urwa is actually the son of Asma bint Abi Bakr. So he is the nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he was also one of Aisha's greatest students. So he's the great nephew student of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ أَعْلَمُ بِقُرْآنِ وَلَا بِفَرِيدًا وَلَا بِحَلَالٍ وَلَا بِحَرَامٍ وَلَا بِشِعْرٍ وَلَا بِحَدِيثِ الْعَرَبِ وَلَا بِنَصَبْ مِنْ عَيْشَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا And Urwa, her nephew, said that I have not seen anyone from among the people more knowledge about the Qur'an, more knowledge about the fara'id, more knowledge about the halal, the haram, poetry, about the akhbar of the Arabs at the time, about genealogy, than Aisha رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا So she was able to uh, have expertise in many different fields uh, of, and it wasn't just limited to one area. She in fact taught 88 different scholars. She uh, was teaching fiqh about the Friday prayer, about the qasr of the salah, about the ahkam of fasting. In fact, she would teach thousands of people uh, in hajj when the great delegations would come from all over. And this is obviously the greatest human uh, gathering at one time, one place. It was Aisha radiallahu anha that was teaching the masses from behind the curtain. And you know, we can really appreciate uh, her uh, extreme intelligence when you look at the life uh, the, the amount of time she spent with the Prophet وسلم, only eight to nine years she was married to the Prophet وسلم, but she lived for 50 years after his death so subhanAllah it's very clear that Allah had chosen her for a specific task at the peak of her intelligence, youth, memory, retention so that she would be able to live a lot longer to convey this deen to us and to teach the thousands as she did till this till this day we have her um, pre narrations preserved and continue to uh, be guided through them and notice for us women to learn is that in those prophetic years she wasn't wasting her time and that eight nine years short years that she had with the Prophet وسلم, she wasn't wasting her time in things that would be of no consequence after she died rather she was contributing to a legacy that was larger than her life itself and this is what she left behind and how did she do this? Two things, an inquisitive mind and an activist spirit. She was not shy to ask what she didn't understand. 
And th this knowledge, she converted into eloquence and conveying the message, conveying that knowledge. And in fact, when she would argue with the people, she would win the argument and the Prophet would be so proud of her and say, this is the daughter of Abu Bakr. She is the daughter of Abu Bakr. The other thing about Aisha is her activist spirit. She wasn't content just to you know, be on the sidelines. She was out there in the battlefield. She was nursing the wounded. She was tending to the sick. She was paying attention. She was witnessing and participating in the affairs of the Ummah. And this is really what uh, a, you know, an ideal Muslim woman has to be like. Someone who's involved and out there and shaping and shaking uh, things around her. And this is why she was able to uh, memorize al uh, Quran and pass on uh, thousands of uh, hadith and contribute to the discourse of fiqh and fatawa. And this uh, requires the highest level of uh, specialization and expertise. What I want to say in the few minutes that we have left, the Prophet said about Aisha, Inna fadl Aisha ala nisa ka fadl al-thariz ala sa'ir al-ta'am. That the fadl or the virtue of Aisha over all of the women is like the fadl of al-thariz on the rest of the food. And al was actually a type of very wholesome, nutritious soup in the time of the Prophet وسلم, which in and of itself, it constituted an entire meal. When the day you had a tharid for dinner, you didn't have to have anything else. It didn't need a side dish. So the point of the hadith is that Aisha alone is the complete package. She is the complete woman. She combines the taqwa, the knowledge, the activism, the spirituality. Um, that is what uh, embodies a true ideal Muslim woman. Now, you know, all of this uh, amazing knowledge that she had has to lead to something. You know, all of us come to these conferences every year and we learn so much, uh, you know, knowledge. But if we don't really uh, translate that into action and, and, and behavior, it's just information, like a donkey carrying books. So what are the real fruits of the knowledge that's shown forth in the character of Aisha? And that's none other than Number one, her zuhud. Her zuhud, yani her lack of attachment to the dunya. After you have knowledge of the dunya, the logical response is that you don't attach yourself to it. And this is how she subsisted in the time of the Prophet without complaining. They said that they used to live on, no fire would be in their house for months, and they subsisted basically on al-aswadan, water and dates, you know the famous narration. And she, even afterwards, was much given to fasting. She would choose actually the longest, hottest day of the year to fast. Because she understood that the reward is going to be proportioned to the diligence and effort put behind it. And once when the Muslims afterwards became you know, quite rich and affluent, at the time of Muawiyah, she was given a gift of 100,000 dirham. And she was fasting that day. And the day did not end until she had distributed the entire 100,000 dirham to the poor and the needy. And her servant came to her and said, you know, if, if you had just kept one dirham for yourself to buy something for your iftar, you don't even have food to break your fast with. If you had just kept one dirham out of the 100,000 dirham. And look at her response. She said, that, oh, if you had reminded me, I, I would have done that. She didn't even remember that she has a need of her own to fulfill in a few hours. This is the true Zahida. This is someone who is completely detached, completely disinterested in dunya and what it has to offer. Now, another great quality of Aisha is her humility. Now, when although she had this distinguished status among the wives of the Prophet and the painful incident of her being accused of adultery took place, she actually narrates her own story of that painful time in her life. It was probably the most painful time in her life before the death of the Prophet She said that out of her humility, she said, I never thought that Qur'an would actually be revealed with that about me. She said, in her own words, لا شأني في نفسي كان أحقر أن يتكلم الله فيها بأمر يتلا. She said, I thought of myself as so insignificant that I never thought it possible that Actually, Allah would speak about me in verses that were going to be recited. But what she was hoping for was a dream that the Prophet would have, where Allah would tell him that she's uh, you know, free of what they're accusing her of. But SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored her because of this humility with ayat, verses that are going to be recited till the Day of Judgment, eternalizing her mention, her purity, and her innocence. 
And subhanAllah, this is exactly the meaning of the hadith which says, Man Allah. That one who lowers him or herself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah raises them up. Because she was so humble, look at the way Allah honored her in a way that no other uh, person had achieved. The next thing I want to uh, briefly talk about uh, in the five minutes we have left. Okay, inshallah. Um, I think we have zero minutes left. Um, just a little bit about her, uh, the way she supported uh, other women in the field of, of knowledge. She had many, many female students. In fact, she had like a madrasa in Medina where she was, you know, teaching thousands. And she used to praise the women of the Ansar that they did not let their shyness uh, obstruct them from gaining knowledge. That they were, this is some, their shyness, although they were women of haya, this was not the type of haya that was blameworthy. That would actually prevent them from, uh, from learning. Unfortunately, I have to skip a lot and just, inshallah, go to the end where we want to talk about her contribution in preserving the last dying moments of the Prophet When the Prophet was in the final days of his sickness, you know he used to give a turn to his wives. One day he would be with one wife and the next day would be someone else's turn. So he was asking, Aina ana ghadan, Aina ana ba'da ghadan, where are we to be tomorrow, where are we to be after tomorrow? The wives understood that he wants to be in the house of Aisha in this final days of his sickness. So they graciously um, gave up their turns and he came to Aisha. And she's the one who preserved the final dying moments of the Prophet and narrated us to them something everybody would want to know the details of. And what happened at that time and those moments that led up to his, um, led up to his death She's the one who told us that as his head was on her chest, as his soul was about to be taken uh, from her lap, and he was buried in her house, this was an honor that no one had except Aisha radiallahu And she's the one who related to us the last words of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what were his last words? Ila rafiqa la'ala, ila rafiqa la'ala, which means to the highest company, to the supreme company because you know prophets are given a choice at the time of their death between dunya and akhirah and they're shown their place in paradise after seeing that no one chooses dunya so the prophet sallallahu said ila rafiqa la'ala ila rafiqa la'ala and then his hand fell and she knew that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam between her chest and lap in her house he fell it was only her she says and the angel of death at that time at that last moment of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam you know, at that point when his soul left uh, this world, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a whole era of her life was over. That eight, nine years uh, she has spent with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were gone forever, and her grief was overwhelming. But in the aftermath of the anguish that lingered long after those final painful moments. She was able to productively channel the memories of her years with her husband, the Prophet وسلم, in the most valuable and the most lasting manner. Until more than 50 years later, on Tuesday, the 17th of Ramadan, in the 57th year of the Hijrah, at the age of 66, Aisha radiallahu was also recalled back to the one who had recalled her husband 50 years earlier. On her deathbed, she was visited by someone and she didn't want to meet the visitor because she was afraid he would praise her because she was dying. And she was very careful in what she said. He asked her, how are you? And she said, I'm okay as long as I fear Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her salat al janazah was led by Abu Huraira, radiallahu anh, who was the top narrator of hadith, who used to go to Aisha, radiallahu anh, when he disputed with another sahabi over an issue. He's the one who led her janaza. She was buried at night in the Jannat al baqiyah And it is said that on that occasion, on that night, there were never that many people seen at night on the streets of Medina than the day that the beloved of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was buried. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to emulate the likes of Aisha radiallahu anha and make her proud and the messengers Allah was so pleased with us the day we meet them. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa tubulik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So she won't be able to do it. But uh, as a consolation, uh, we actually have a really exciting 
um, activity right now. Uh, we, uh, as Young Muslims, uh, the organization that organizes a youth conference, we love giving away things, especially free things. So um, we're going to uh, play a little activity where the first 10 people who uh, have a post-it in their hand and bring it up to me in the front of the room uh, will win a free prize. Okay? And 